As probably all of you know, that in situ detection of protein and DNA has been uh, very well established by immunohistochemistry and fish technology. And they are the main tool for tissue diagnostics and the companion diagnostics. Yet, there's no technology to look at the RNA in situ for the purpose of clinical diagnostic applications. And that is a gap that we intend to uh, fill with our RNA scope technology and that is capable of single molecule detections. Uh, one reason there's such a need for in situ RNA detection is the fact that many of those biomarkers identified from genomic discovery are RNA based. They're coming from microarrays, they're coming from next gen sequencing, and translating those biomarkers uh, into validated one for diagnostic applications remains to be a challenge. And right now, there are two major approaches. One is real-time PCR, and the other is immunohistochemistry. Both are powerful technologies, yet each has its limitations. For real-time PCR, the issue is lack of cellular resolutions, and also the workflow remains to be complicated. And for example, like genomic health, oncotype DX test, uh, you need a pathology look at the individual slides and they have to do macro dissection to remove uh, the normal tissues and necrosis tissue before they can do RNA extraction and for PCR analysis. And so that kind of process, it's okay for LDTs, but it's much more difficult for in vitro diagnostic applications. On the other hand, immunohistochemistry does not have this problem. Uh, it has uh, fully automated assays. It has cellular and tissue contacts. But for many of those RNA-based markers, uh, it's just difficult to find good antibody that has, has sufficient sensitivity and specificity for clinical diagnostic applications. And that's where RNA scope come along, where it has PCR-like sensitivity and specificity, uh, and IHC-like workflow and cellular contacts. Now, why do we want to detect RNA in situ? Uh, one of the reasons is that the cellular contacts is very important for a biomarker's clinical relevance. As we know, in a, in a cancer situation, not only you have cancer cells, but you also have stroma cell, you also have immune cell, and you have blood vessel invasion. All those tumor microenvironment are now to play a critical role influencing cancer progressions. And we now more and more have appreciation on the tumor microenvironment's contribution uh, to prognosis and to, to uh, disease progressions. Uh, furthermore, even within the tumor cell, you know, you have concept of cancer stem cell, and there's a tremendous amount of appreciation these days about intratumor heterogeneity, particularly coming from uh, next-gen sequencing analysis where uh, you can find multiple clones within the tumor cell populations. And a real-time PCR-like grind-bind method uh, would have lost those critical tissue contacts, and that are important. Uh, for more accurate uh, clinical diagnosis. And IHC, of course, would be great because it has cellular contacts and tissue contacts. But the problem there is that, uh, you know, based on database, 30% of human gene does not have IHC antibodies. 54% of genes that has a single IHC antibody, out of that, only 14% of it has supportive evidence such as Western blood or, or real-time PCRs. So, and for the remaining 16%, where you have a multiple antibody against the one target, only one third of those genes uh, whose target uh, give you consistent standing patterns. So overall, about over 70% of genes, you just don't have good immunohistochemistry antibody. And so far, there's only about 300 or so a diagnostic grade antibodies. So there's a tremendous amount of unmet need. And the reason for this unmet need is the fact that it's technically challenging to generate a good antibody, especially for secreted proteins, such as growth factors, chemokines, cytokines. There were three or four thousands of them, where because they are diffused out of a cell, uh, it's gener generally very difficult to generate a good antibody for it. Uh, you also have many of those GPCRs, transcriptional factors, and some of the receptors 
uh, whose expression level to be too low to be reliably detected by antibodies. And we talked about antibody specificity issue. Uh, even for good antibody, like HER2 antibody, uh, you still have 20-30% of patients who get equivocal results. And then there's a, this new uh, discovery of non-coding RNA, which is in the tens of thousands, where you simply don't have antibody to look at them in situ. And many of them have been shown to be uh, important for diagnostic and pro prognostic applications. In situ RNA detection technology uh, is not new. Uh, actually, the first publication of RNA in situ is in 1969, where they used a radioactive isotope labeled probe to detect 18S RNAs. And over the last 40 years or so, uh, people have constantly tried to improve the technology uh, with a, ver a variety of different approaches, such as in situ PCR, uh, tyramide signal application, uh, quantum dot, et cetera, where they have limited improvement in, signal, uh, in, in sensitivity and specificity, and workflow remains to be complicated. And we figure the reason that the previous technology only achieved a limited improvement is the fact that uh, they have always think about improving the signal, uh, boosting up signal. But in the process, when they boost up signal, they also boost up a background. So there's only limited improvement in signal to noise ratio. And that's where our technology, our scope, come into play, where we have came up with a proprietary strategy to selectively amplify signal without amplifying the background. As a result, we can achieve several hundred fold of improvement in signal noise ratio to the point of single molecule detection. So how do we achieve that? And this slide uh, shows the uh, principle of the assay. It's basically assuming that, that there's a target RNA uh, inside the cells. What we have come up is a strategy to develop a two independent oligonucleotide probe that hybridize to the target RNA right next to each other simultaneously. And we design in a way that the probe side that binds to the target RNA is about 25 base or so, which enables stable hybridization. But on the other side, that the hybridize to the single amplification molecule is only 14 base each. But when two of them next to each other, 14 plus 14, you would get 28 base binding site that allow you to stably hybridize to a pre-amplification molecule, which then hybridize to an amplification molecule, which then hybridize to a label probe. And the label probe can be either enzyme labeled, such as HRP or AP labeled, or fluorescent labeled which give you fluorescent signals. So in essence, you're building a Christmas tree that associates with double Z probe, which covers about 50 base, to as many as 400 of those label probes, giving 400 fold of signal amplifications. And we do that uh, for each RNA molecule, we cover as much as one KB sequence with 20 of those double Z signal amplification units so that each one RNA sequence can be associated with as many as 8,000 fluorescent or chromatic label signals, sufficient to be seen at a single molecule level for any gene you want. And this in contrast to a non-special hybridization situation where you may have a non-special target, the chances are that you may have one single Z that binds to a non special target, but chances of two independent oligo binds to a non special target and right next to each other is too close to zero. So, as a result, here you only have a 14 base tail, which is not sufficiently stable to hybridize to this signal amplification molecules. As a result, we have achieved selective amplification of signal without amplifying the backgrounds. Now, with this design, we can also do multiplex analysis relatively easily. In this case, basically, we just need to build different signal amplification trees that does not cross-hybridize with each other. And for different genes of interest, 
we can design a different double Z probe set that hybridize to different signal amplification molecules. And with a fluorescent-based assay, you can easily do four-plex analysis, and that's what we can do here. And another way to do this, you can pull many targets together, for example, 10 or 15 targets together, uh, in order to see whether any of the targets are present in the sample of interest or in the cell type of interest. So in this case, you can simultaneously measure many target RNA in one go with one color signals. The workflow of the assay are actually now very similar to immunohistochemistry. You start with routine formally fixed paraffin embedded tissue specimen. It went through deparaffinization and epitol, uh, antigen retrieval followed with protease digestion. Then you start with target probe hybridization, which is similar to primary antibody binding. Then followed with signal amplification event, which is very similar to sort of a polymer-based amplification events. Followed with label probe hype, which is sort of like HRP or AP labeled antibody binding. And followed with either fluorescent-based assay uh, uh, label or color matching reactions, just like immunocrystal chemistries. So the workflow-wise is very much the same as immunocrystal chemistry. Now these slides give you some of the images that we got from our assay. It can be either fluorescent-based or color matrix based And for fluorescent-based at a higher magnification, you may recognize that this image looks very similar to uh, DNA fish, except now we look at the RNA and some of the signals are outside the nuclei. Here, each one of the individual dots are single RNA molecules, and, and because we have done a lot of work on this and the result is published, I'm not, not gonna get into detail as to why each individual dot uh, are known to be one molecule, but just take my words for it, and you can also read the paper. Uh, here, the green color are uh, individual BCR molecule, and the red color are uh, individual ABL molecule, and the yellow dots are BCR, ABL, fusion, messenger RNAs. And this example of HER2 messenger expression in a patient that contain HER2 amplification. This example of a stem cell marker. And this example of a duplex color matrix assay where we look at the two markers and look at their relative locations of the two genes. Here example of a multiplex fluorescent analysis of three markers uh, in routine clinical samples. And this example of detecting an analysis of circulating tumor cell uh, in the blood, where this assay does not require traditional enrichment that the traditional CTC detection technology requires. And because of the multiplex capability, you can do detection as well as molecular categorization at the same time. Now this slide just gives you a nice image of, uh, of a four-plex assay where four genes are expressed at different levels. For HPRT1, uh, which is a low copy expression gene, you have maybe a few of those green dots, maybe 10 copies or so. And for RPLP0 and PBIB, they are median expression genes you get 50 to 100 copies per cell. And for beta actin, you have a very high level expression to the point that you don't see any dots anymore. The dots are merged together. And this slide really gives you a good example as to why this technology can offer a unique advantage over some of the traditional technology. This is a three-plex assay looking at PEN-CK, which is uh, CK8, 18, and 19 demarcating where the tumor cell is by the aqua color. You also have two markers uh, for UPA in green and PI1 in red. And these are two secreted proteins. And you can see that in this slide that they are only expressed in the stromal cell. And they express in stromal cell immediately surround the tumor cell. And they are not present uh, further away from the tumors. Now, what's interesting about these two markers is that these two markers are known to be prognostic for early stage breast cancer. In fact, they are already in the ASCO clinical guideline. 
they have achieved the level one evidence of clinical validation. But because the current test is a ELISA-based test that requires 300 milligrams of fresh frozen tissue, uh, which logistically just not feasible to do. As a result, even though they have a high level of validation, uh, there's no clinical adoption uh, in the US. There's very little adoption in the Europe as well. And people have tried to develop antibody for immunohistochemistry, but because they are secreted proteins, uh, that you couldn't come up with a good antibody to detect them. And because there are only a few cells uh, that express those two markers at the RNA level, even a PCR-based approach doesn't have the robustness to detect them um, uh, robustly. So this slide shows the uh, comparison of RNA scope technology with a radioisotope labeled method very traditional method that are, to this day, remains to be the most sensitive methods. And you can see with this particular probe, and this is the level signal you're getting, and this is the level background you're getting in those black dots. And this is after 48 hour exposure. And with our assay, this is the level signal you're getting. And look at the morphology that you can get with this assay. And this is the level background that you're getting, which is almost completely clean. So uh, this assay uh, is more sensitive and less, uh, more specific than the traditional radioactive method. How about its comparison with traditional non-isotopic in situ? And so this is a good example. This is a, a slide uh, that was done by Jack Astor at NCI, uh, who have spent the last 15 years studying the mechanism of HIV infection using SIV as a model assistance. And this is the level of signal they're getting. And this is the level of signal they're getting with our technologies. So there's really a tremendous amount of difference uh, in terms of level sensitivities. In fact, if you look at this under the high magnification, you can see individual viral particles. And they saw it was really useful for them to understand the mechanism of infection, but also to understand this HIV latency issue uh, that people are trying to, to address. Now, what are the advantages of this technology? One of the advantages is its scalability. Uh, this is a, a manual assay uh, that we have commercialized over the last couple of years or so. And for different genes that you want to detect from any species, there's only one tube that's different. And this is a tube of oligonucleotide probes every other component is exactly the same. And because those are standard oligonucleotide, where we can design and synthesize within a couple of weeks. So for any new assay you want to develop, it's really a plug and play. And we've got over 600 assays already available. The other advantage of this system is that the assay condition is the same for every gene you want to detect. Because RNA are located within the cytoplasma. And this is in contrast to protein, where you may have a membrane protein or nuclear protein, or depends on the antibody, you may optimize your assay conditions. Here, assay condition is exactly the same once you establish it. With this approach, then, uh, we can rapidly move those candidate biomarkers from genomic discovery. We can pick all the top candidates, generate the assay, which has 100% success, success rate, and move rapidly into clinical validation in contrast to immunohistochemistry where you have to generate antibody first and with unknown chance of success for, for the antibodies. The other important feature of this assay is that this assay now is fully uh, automated. And we have automated this assay uh, into the Ventana discovery systems. Uh, as you know, the Ventana has the largest market share of automated standing systems. And with this system, we now have the capability of using routine clinical sample, just like immunohistochemistry and fish, running on the instrument that are running for IHC and the fish. Uh, by the push of button, towards the end of the day, you're getting results that looks very similar to IHC and the fish, which can be interpreted by the same pathologist to look at the IHC and the fish results. So there's really no change in terms of pathology workflow 
which should facilitate the easier adoption of this technology as IVD platforms. This slide just gives you some of the images that we got from fully automated assay without getting into the details. But really, there were a couple of major advantages for automation. Uh, one of the advantages, of course, is time saving. You can set up the assay in the morning and get the result in the afternoon. Or you can set up the assay in the afternoon and get the result next morning. But the other advantage is that the reproducibility and the standardization this entails. Uh, in fact, if you look at the intro run CV and inter run CV by counting the individual iron dot within the cell lines, the average CV is around 10 to 15 percent. So it's almost comparable to some of those solution based assays out there. So it's quite uh, reproducible. Because each RNA molecule appears as a single dot, we can leverage that capability for digital quantitation to look at the single cell expression level for individual RNA markers. Uh, for this goal, we have collaborated with Definience to come up with image analysis software to count the spots with individual cells and get the single cell copy numbers. Now, uh, in our lineup, uh, we have Dr. David Rim from Yale University, who is a founder of HistoRx, where he has developed aqua technology that can also quantify the expression of protein as well as RNA uh, using their platforms. And, uh, and he will show some of the nice results that he is getting with, uh, with that technology uh, for quantitations. Now, with this image analysis capabilities, you can get a result that's very similar to a histo score in the IHC. I'm just using that as an example here. We'll look at the three samples. Patient sample has a very level of HER2 messenger expression. Uh, in this case, you have relatively high level of HER2 expression. As a result, you see about 30% of cell that has more than 30 copies per cell. You have roughly about 20% of cell that has about 10 to 30 copy per cell. And you know, you have much less have low expressions. Now in this sample, you have 95% of cell that has almost no expressions. So you can quantify expression um, based on the image analysis tools. How does this compare with real-time PCR results? Now, these two clearly are measuring not exactly the same thing. Real-time PCR, you grind the entire tissue up, you get the average expression of the genes, and you normalize expression against the housekeeping genes. With RNA scope, you measure the single cell expression level, you get roughly how many copies per cell. But even with that kind of a quantitation, you get fairly a significant correlation between the two technologies. Now, this is a study that we've done in collaboration with Dr. Ray Topslap. Now, what about its correlation with the disease biology? Now, in this study, we have looked at the correlation with HER2 fish test. And we show that it has a high concordance with HER2 fish results. All the positive cases by fish was called positive by RNA scope. And almost all the negative cases are called negative by RNA scope technologies except two cases. So you have 97.3% concordance, uh, which is within the 95% cutoff uh, of the ASCO cap guidelines. Now, this is the cases for fish results that are, are unequivocal, meaning the fish HER2 over CYP17 is either over 2.2 or below 1.8. And what about cases that are equivocal, meaning the fish result was between 1.8 and 2.2, or heterogeneous cases. And there's a, a podium presentation uh, in the uh, San Antonio Breast Cancer Conference in December, uh, talk about that, and I encourage you to, to follow up on that stories. Now, at the beginning, I mentioned about this large gap between the candidate biomarker that I discovered from genomic discovery to validate tests for tissue diagnostics. And we have used this technology to went through the entire process. And for that, we are addressing the issue of melanoma, trying to distinguish 
a severe atypical nevi to melanoma, which some of you may know is very difficult to distinguish by histology alone. And there's no good molecular test out there to do these distinctions. So in this case, we have looked at the public database of several microarray data set, and we came up with 23 candidate genes. And we look at these 23 genes in a tissue microarray that contains about 100 samples. And we narrow down to six genes. And we then followed up this six gene on 50 more cases of melanoma or nevis. Then we further narrow down to three genes. And based on the presence of any one of those three genes, we would call the case melanoma. Uh, if the case are negative for all three genes, then it's likely to be a nevis. And this study uh, will be presented at the US CAP next year. I encourage you to follow up on that. So to summarize, this is a technology that has many advantages. Compared with real-time PCR, the advantage is a workflow and cellular tissue context. It also has a simplicity. It has for full automation and is more suitable for IVD development. Compared with immunohistochemistry, it works for every gene in the human genome. It has better sensitivity and specificity, has better quantitation and multiplex capability, and is more standardized. And technology has been used in the marketplace for translational research by both industry and academic centers. And to summarize, uh, this is a technology that is capable of single molecule detection. It's a fully automated assay for routine clinical samples, and it can be easily adopted in the current pathology workflow. It enables rapid translation from discovery to tissue diagnostics, and there's already over 600 assays uh, in the marketplace. With that, I thank you for your attention.